new MacBook Pro M1. This has been a daily driver for me pretty much since they came out. So I've been using it for, I don't know, six weeks or so, seven weeks. I got mixed feelings. So let's dig in and talk about it. First things first, let's talk about connectivity. Two USB-Cs only. Uh, I believe they're Thunderbolt 3s. Definitely great throughput. But really, could have done with a couple more on the other side. It is a pain when you can only plug in on one side with a charger, but your power is at the other side of the wall. Over on the other side, got the good old-fashioned headphone jack. Still use it sometimes, and you can't beat just plugging in a set of headphones, not having to worry about, did I charge them up? Did they die because I've been on the phone too long all day long? They just keep going and going and going. Other than that, very familiar Apple. Looks exactly like the previous MacBook Pro. They didn't change a thing. Weight feels good in your hand. Still don't like the sharp corners. I've never been a fan of this with the MacBooks. On the old, old ones, probably going back about four or five years, I actually thought they were a little too sharp. And I think if I remember correctly, there were forums online where people were taking a little bit of sandpaper, actually, uh, you know, chamfering the edge a little bit. So I guess they've learned from that, but you got the familiar little cutout, get your thumb in there. I mean, look, it's a MacBook Pro. What can I say? It looks and feels just like all the other ones. From a weight perspective, from a fit and finish perspective and a feel perspective in your hands, Definitely a thumbs up on my new Mikey rating. We're going to go thumbs up or thumbs down on key areas of each laptop that we look at. I don't want to do a star rating. I don't want to do an 8 out of 10 because I don't know whether 8 out of 10 or 7.5 out of 10 is really that much different. And I don't know whether you do too. So thumbs up so far. Going to open the lid. They made a big thing about this at the uh, demonstration there with all the folks doing the virtual thing. You know, he's opening the lid and everybody did the memes and it's instant on. Do I care that the, the, the thing comes on before I've even got the lid open? I don't know that I do. By the time I've got it all the way back there, it could have gone a second or two. I really don't care. And it's not that big of a deal. It's basically the same as the last one with a different chip. You know, screen movement, still smooth, still fluid, stops all the way. Nice kind of, you know, level of friction there. It's the same keyboard. Obviously, they upgraded it about a generation ago from all the bad press of the butterfly keyboard. I'm still not a fan of the MacBook keyboards. I would take the HP Spectre over this keyboard any day. Look, it's nice. It's shallow travel. I can type quick on it. I'm going to give it a thumbs up. Not hating on it. Okay, I'm not saying thumbs down. I just don't think it's as good as it can be. This is definitely better than a lot of machines out there. I just don't think it's the best. And I still don't get the touch bar. Like, seriously. I never look down there. I rarely touch the buttons. It's not intuitive. It's still not on a MacBook Air. You know, it's still not on the iMac keyboard. Like, either go go big or go home. Let's let's put them on everything so that developers take advantage of it or don't bother putting it on anything. I mean, it's nice, it's quirky. Dude, it's a gimmick for me. I still don't think it's worth the extra cost. I still don't think overall it makes that much of a difference. There's definitely going to be some niche cases where you can train yourself to use it. But muscle memory, again, it's there. We're so used to certain things. And especially if you're flip-flopping between devices, which I do, and I think you know many other users do as well. It's common to have you know a docking setup. Okay, so I buy Apple's keyboard, but I got no touch bar on it. But my MacBook's up here on a little stand, and it's you know seven inches off the top. I don't want to reach all the way up there to touch a, the touch bar. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to use it that way. It's the same criticism that people said about touch screens. I'm not going to lift my arm up and touch it because it's too much energy. It's too much effort. It's not natural. I, I just don't get it. At least they put an escape key on there. So now that you've got an actual physical key and you've got the uh, touch ID, look, let's talk about touch ID for a second. It's a great idea. I understand the security of it. I understand how great it is to be able to touch a fingerprint and not type a password. But please, oh, please, Apple, do I have to touch ID 900 times in a row when I just want to log into something? A password comes up. I've got a touch ID with my email address. Then it goes to the password field. I've got a touch ID again. We can't make touch ID just work once. Like I just touched it. Why have I got to touch it again? I know it sounds like a niggle, but when you're using this thing all day, every day, and you're constantly logging in and out of websites, and they've got two-factor authentication going as well. Now I'm touching, and then I'm touching again, and I got to go look at my phone, or I got to pull up iMessage if I'm, I've got my iPhone hooked up and syncing so I can see the code. It, it's just not a smooth experience. It doesn't feel very Apple. I think they could do better. I got to tell you, Windows is, is a lot smoother with the facial recognition and the Windows Hello or whatever they call it. So Touch ID, you know, it's a great it's a great idea. 
on the MacBook, if I could buy this without Touch ID, personally, I absolutely would. Outside of that, big touchpad, same as always. Again, not a huge fan. I get that it sounds really cool. There's no moving parts and this haptic things making it feel like I'm pressing on it and all that kind of stuff. But I like to work in quiet and the, the constant click of this touchpad, I just find it really irritating. I don't know what it is. It just bothers me. I don't have the same feeling when I'm using other touchpads. I definitely like how smooth it is. I wish Windows could make a touchpad as smooth as this. None of the devices I've used um, really are unequal. HP Spectre uh, that we reviewed a few weeks ago comes very close. Dell XPSs, when the touchpad works, they get kind of close. Fortunately, they don't work half the time from my experience. And we've tried about four of them in this new range. Um, I don't know what to say. Love the smooth, hate the click. But that's personal opinion. Overall, I think Apple touchpads are still the touchpads to beat. And then we get to the screen. Again, it's the same screen. It's the same resolution. It's not 4K. It's a little bit better than 1080p. It's kind of somewhere in the middle that suited Apple and the, you know, the gods in the, in the kind of industrial design studio when they were putting it together. Um, personally, I'm still puzzled by the, the large bezel that goes across the top of the screen. I get that it's supposed to be symmetrical with the bottom. I just think that bezels are going away. This is cutting edge. I suspect they're going to stretch this to a 14 inch. That's what the rumors are saying. And I think it's about time. It looks it looks outdated. I don't need a chin at the bottom and I don't need a forehead at the top. Stretch the screen. Let's get rid of the bezels. Let's make it look a little bit more cutting edge and, um, and give me a bit more real estate while we're at it. It's definitely uh, a better ratio. You know, I like my tall screens. It's not as tall as the 3.2 but a 1610 is, is in the right track. After talking about the physical aspects, screen, still a thumbs up for me. You know, not as good as the OLED, not as good as some of the high-risk screens that are out there, but it's still a thumbs up. It's definitely a nice screen. It's definitely workable. You're not going to have any issues with it. Uh, good brightness. We come to performance, right? We come to technology. The machine is basically identical. Uh, some internal upgrades. Wi-Fi is a little bit better. Everything Everything revolves around this M1 chip. And if you don't know what Apple, Apple Silicon is, get my words out, um, Apple have designed their own custom processor and they've taken lots of other parts from a motherboard, a system board, and they've kind of fused them all into what they're calling a unified chip or a unified architecture. I don't want to geek out. If you want to get all techy, there's plenty of great reviews out there. Go check them out. Um, but basically, the memory is now on the chip with the processing unit. There's a couple of other things that help speed up data transfer throughout Look, they've done a great job. I mean, it's a step in the right direction. It's executed extremely well for a first generation computer running Apple Silicon. Absolutely hats off to these guys, thumbs up. It's a great processor. The eight gig of memory feels way more than eight gig. It definitely flies normal day-to-day -day use. You do not need anything more than you are buying off the shelf with this thing. 256 is a little low on the storage for my liking. It's about time 512 became standard. I understand why it's not, but I still think it is about time it was. The problem, I think, with this chip is not everything runs on it. And that's a real issue depending on what kind of a user you are. I use Adobe, uh, Premiere, um, Final Cut, also for video editing. Big difference between the two of them when they're running. Uh, I'm in Photoshop. I'm in InDesign. Programs that are still running in emulation mode. And Apple have included an emulator here with the device so that it can run legacy applications. And for the most part, it does run them relatively well. I've definitely had more than a few stumblings in some of the Adobe products. I've definitely had hangs. I've had Final Cut Crash, and that's an Apple program built for Apple Silicon and built for Big Sur. That's pretty frustrating, and I've had it happen more than once. Uh, I've had Chrome freeze up on me. I've had the mouse freeze up on me when I've been working with other windows open. Now, I understand I'm not a typical user, and I get that. I'm just giving you my experience because you may need to do some of these things. I don't live in Photoshop. I don't live in Premiere, but I definitely drop in and out of them for, you know, 30 minutes here and an hour there in any given week. And I think many small business owners and entrepreneurs are probably very similar because we wear many hats and we do many things and we don't have guys on the team that can do it all. And if we do, they may not be available to do some of the things we want to do. So I think from a, a home user perspective and a light user, you should have no problems running the M1 processor with Big Sur. I think for a small business entrepreneur, I would encourage you to think really carefully about the software that you're using. Ask yourself how much of the software is going to be not optimized for Mac yet? And is it better to wait? Or can you live with those hiccups, niggles, and issues? Because they're going to be there. 
and I realize they're all working on it, it's the trade-off that you expect, but I don't know that it's a trade-off I can live with with a $12.99 starting price. And realistically, if I want that 5, 12 gig SSD, I'm really at $14.99. For $1,500, I can buy a whole lot of anything. I mean, seriously, I could almost buy a tower and a laptop in the Windows world. Would they be the same fit and finish and quality? Okay, you know, there's definitely a subjective perspective there. But all I care about is getting my work done, getting my work done efficiently, and getting it done without losing any of it because something crashed. You decide for you. That's my opinion on that one. Last thought, I think that is very relevant today, and this has left me completely baffled. I understand cost cutting, but I think this is a step too far. The webcam is just unacceptable for 2021. We are living in a world where everybody's Zooming, everybody's teams in, everybody's FaceTiming. We're all doing the video chat thing, and they've kept the same 720p, 720, not 1080, 720p camera on this thing that is just unacceptable on every level. Phones have got better cameras. I think pretty much every Windows machine out there has got better. I think even 399 Chromebooks have got better cameras. My kid's, you know, toy at Christmas has probably got a better camera. Apple's response, well, we kind of optimize the software and it does some really cool AI stuff. So in other words, you recognize the camera is pretty much lame. And so you had to make the software try and do something to make it look a little bit better. Just put a better camera in there. And you might think I'm being a little bit harsh, but look, people rave about MacBooks and how long they last. Longevity is a reason you buy these things. You're spending a lot of money on a device and you're going to use this for three, four, five years. I can promise you in five years, 8K is going to be mainstream and having a 720p camera back from 2001 is going to be such a laughing stock. I just don't understand it. The only thing I can think is, they deliberately left it that way when they redesigned that screen and they bring this 14 inch shrunken bezel masterpiece out. I guarantee it's going to have an upgraded camera and they deliberately left this one low to make that one look better. Again, it's their choice. They're a computer company. They can do whatever they want. It was all about the M1 chip and they didn't want to take away from it. I just struggle with it because there's a lot of people out there who went out and bought one of these for the kids at Christmas. They're going out buying one of these now, not understanding you know, that this is a very, very first generation Apple Silicon product, that it is going to be refreshed, that it is going to be replaced um, in every way with a new look, a new feel, a new design. That's my thoughts. Overall, we're doing a thumbs up on fit and finish. We're doing a thumbs up on the weight. We're doing a thumbs up on battery life. Haven't really talked about it a lot. Mentioned it already in my other reviews. Stellar battery life. Nothing can beat it. You know, 17, 18 hours. Great. You're going to get through a day. You're going to end up charging it anyway. You, know, you might get through a couple of days. Um, there's not really much more to say. It's fabulous. Thumbs up for sure. Thumbs up on the keyboard, even though it's not my personal favorite. Thumbs up on the screen, even though it's not my personal favorite. I think overall, you're probably getting this vibe. It's kind of good enough, but it's kind of good enough. And I don't know that that's what I expect from Apple. I expect more than that. You know, I expect over-engineering. I expect great. And when I look at this compared to other things in the marketplace and other options that you've got out there, if you're not married to Mac OS and you're looking at this kind of price point, this kind of size, my advice to you would be go check out the competition, go look around at the Windows world and see if you can find something that meets your needs because you're definitely gonna get a lot more of the future proofing than you are with this one. Hope you enjoyed the review. Let me know in the comments below. And hey, if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner and you wanna check out a new podcast, go to the Mike Thacker Show. You can see it above my shoulder everywhere that podcasts are available or head to my website and you can uh, find it there also be amazing with mike.com until next time let's go out there and be amazing it was thursday afternoon my ceo looks at me in the car and says mike i think we're going to get arrested and spend the night in jail and i'm thinking holy moly we can't do that what on earth is happening